Hi guys, it is a beautiful day today, so let's talk about some ugly things. <laughs> today we're um, talking about a movie set in a um, mental asylum, as it was called at the time. It's a film called Shock Corridor from 1963, and it's basically an exploitation film, which means um, it's kind of a B-movie, and it exploits the situation for any kind of salacious interesting, uh, shocking kind of details that will make a story kind of sensationalized. Um, so this one is directed by Sam Fuller and uh, he also wrote the story. He apparently wrote it back in the 40s and uh, he wanted Fritz Lang to work on it but couldn't, couldn't sort of make it happen, couldn't get it greenlit. So here it is sitting in the 60s. That's my cat. Come here, are you going to settle down? <laughs> I have a feeling my cat's going to drive me mad during this. Anyway, so the main character is Johnny, played by Peter Breck. Um, he's a reporter and he has himself admitted to an asylum in order to try and solve a murder that took place there. And his big plan is that it's going to be this amazing story and he's going to get himself a Pulitzer Prize. So he wants to get himself a Pulitzer Prize. That's his big plan. Um, so he gets his uh, girlfriend, who is a stripper, to uh, pretend to be his sister and make a complaint against him so he can be admitted. Um, she really doesn't want to help him. She thinks it's a bad idea. It's very dangerous. And uh, it turns out she's right. <laughs> but throughout the movie, everyone's just sort of like... Kathy, if you really loved him, you'd just do what he wants. Um, so, I feel quite bad for Kathy. Um, but yeah, his, the film is basically structured around, uh, very loosely, around these three witnesses. One of them knows who did it, so he has to kind of approach each one. But really, the film feels much more loose form than that, and it almost feels... Um, almost improvised um just in its sort of looseness um so yeah this is as i said an exploitation type film um everyone like this film is so loud like <laughs> it's like when i was watching it i was just thinking it sounds like a heart like worse than most of the horror movies i watch it's just screaming constantly and yelling um, everyone is at 100% hysterical pretty much at all times, except for the doctors who kind of have, are at 100% sinister. Um, so it's like a real kind of melodramatic B-movie. Um, so I think loosely this film is based on Nellie Bly's case. So she was really famous in the 1880s um for a couple of things she was a journalistic pioneer so she's quite like she broke the mold in a lot of ways she also went around the world um in 72 days so she'd made herself quite famous but she did the same thing as in this story she talked herself into um the women's lunatic asylum which is what it was called then on blackwell island because there were lots of rumors about the um, brutality and neglect and this kind of thing. And especially in the 1880s, people really wanted to brush under the rug any kind of madness in their family. So they sort of wanted to put people in asylums and forget about them. This has kind of changed a bit now. We accept mental health a lot more, um, which is good. But even in the 60s, this was still kind of a problem. Um, so she wrote a really famous expose um, about what was going on in that hospital and um, she didn't win a Pulitzer Prize for it, but she wrote um, a really famous book um, about what she learned in the hospital and helped create reform. Um, so from her work, there's quite a few, there's kind of a, almost a tradition of these kinds of films 
that loosely use a similar structure of somebody being in a mental ward or something like that and the cure is actually being worse than the illness or even that the cures can create mental illness um yeah so this film does focus on the brutality of the cures to some extent it has um straight jackets has those like cold bath cures you know where people are submerged in a bath with like a canvas only their head sticking out um there's, there's a scene with shock treatments um so i think especially because these are all done to um our main character johnny um you kind of really see his sanity slowly eroding over the course of this film um so yeah after especially after the um shock treatment that he has he actually really believes that kathy is his sister that he has incestuous feelings for even though that was just their cover story and she's actually his girlfriend so um yeah it's all very twisted up um so the performances, I mean, this film's a melodrama more than anything, and it really is madness and hysteria to kind of use, a, like, sort of appropriate terms. Um, the performances really range in quality, which is kind of part of the fun. I think, um, let's see, Peter Breck as Johnny is actually, like, fairly good, but... Um, so Constance Towers plays Kathy, so she has like a really long striptease scene, which is actually really funny. Um, it's, fa it's fairly close to the start. She sings a song and takes her clothes off, but she still has like a glittery bikini on. So she's still a... Um... Yeah, I mean, you get the idea that she's a stripper, but it's not like you don't really see anything, you know? Um, but she starts off with like this thick feather boa over her head and it's so weird because as she's breathing and starts to sing the feathers are like moving where her mouth is so it's like some kind of it kind of looks like a sesame street big bird striptease like it's just is really weird um but she's actually i think she's pretty good in this um in this film as much as anyone can be in this film um she's actually from general hospital she was in General Hospital for years up until 2019 um, and then the three uh, witnesses are uh, Gene Evans from Ace in the Hole, James Best from Dukes of Hazard, and Killer Shrews which is like a re another really great bad film and Hari Rhodes who was um, in like a bunch of TV stuff he's one of those people where you might know his face um, so they are the three witnesses um, but everyone is just kind of gets in front of the camera and just starts screaming and writhing around and just having a full on Nicolas Cage level meltdown and it's kind of great, but it's like a lot of noise over the course of the film. Um, so with the three witnesses, um, they have kind of interesting, I feel like the, the mental illnesses in this are very dramatic as well. Like no one just has depression. Everyone's like, has delusions of grandeur or thinks they're someone they're not, or like they're just all like really out there. So the witnesses, um, Stuart thinks he's a Confederate general. So he was um, in the Korean war and they brainwashed him into being a communist in a prisoner of war camp. So then when he came back, he was like ostracized for being a traitor. So that made him go mad um, and retreat into his delusion. Um, Trent was one of the first black students at a segregated university and he was so badly like traumatized by the whole thing that he now thinks he's a member of the KKK. And um, his character is insane. Like I just, by insane, I don't mean, like, mentally ill insane. I mean, who wrote that character? Like, it's just kind of 
intentionally, exploitatively shocking. Um, and the last one is Bowden, who was a scientist working on an uh, atomic bomb and he knew how bad the damage would be so it sent him mad and he's just retreated into his six-year-old self. So those are the people that Johnny has to get in touch with but over the course of the film his sanity is eroding, um, Kathy's getting more and more worried about him and um, his editor really doesn't care basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the main, um, the main kind of thing in this film is that it's shot so interestingly. Like it's, it's very B movie in its choice of actors and all of these things. But then Stanley Cortez comes in with his cinematographic eye. And um, he worked on Magnificent Ambersons with Orson Welles, Night of the Hunter, which we've, I think we've talked about both of these um, before, over on my blog, not here, if you're wondering what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's gone with some really interesting camera angles. Um, the visuals on this film are just like really really clever so there's some um split screen kind of moments oh that's my cat again she doesn't like being locked outside but she also doesn't want to be inside um he has like these dreams where he hallucinates like a mini version of kathy in her stripper outfit um which are kind of look really cool actually and then there's also um Johnny has a voiceover of what he's thinking so you can see like when he's acting crazy he's really thinking something else except then we can really get to see the, how his um, thinking is starting to match up with everybody else's in the asylum or I don't know I think that's like just a really nice like we really get some kind of insight there um, but yeah I think my favorite bit of the whole film is where um, towards the end Johnny hallucinates being alone in the corridor. So the corridor is one of the main um, locations because if you're a good little patient, you get to roam freely in the corridor. So um, I suppose that's where they got the title from. I think they just like the sound of the title, to be honest. Um, but yeah, he wanders around there throughout the film. And so towards the end, he walks down the hallway and it's just raining inside. And so it kind of looks like there's just water everywhere and it's, it's kind of amazing. And then he snaps back to reality and there's no rain and it's just, I don't know, it's just a cool scene, basically. Um, there's also a really interesting <laughs> and probably quite sexist scene where he's looking for the witnesses that he wants to talk to. And he kind of wanders off into this room and then he suddenly realizes, oh my god, I'm in a room with a bunch of nymphomaniacs. And they're all kind of just spouting song lyrics and drawing on the walls like they're um there's no kind of science behind mental illness in this film basically um so yeah they're wandering around that room and then they're like oh my gosh there's a man amongst us and they just attack him and um it's pretty weird and pretty funny but they are kind of like a chanting pack of wild animals but with 60s haircuts it's it's kind of great it's like actually pretty creepy um so towards the end of the film he is talking to his witnesses and he finally gets the name of the person that killed the guy so that's the MacGuffin of this film and um because he's had shock treatment he his memory is kind of troubled so he can't, sometimes he can't remember why he's there. And sometimes he can't remember the name of the guy who is the killer. So you kind of don't know whether he's going to um, be able to resolve the situation. Uh, eventually he does, there's a big spoiler for you. Um, yeah, and then by the end he's, um, should I tell you the ending? 
Probably not. But you kind of get where this film is going. These kinds of stories of mental asylums, they never have a good ending. Um, so it's a kind of weird and wonderful little film. Um, it's been on quite a few sort of much watch, must watch lists. Um, for good reason, like the cinematography and just the drama is like, there's something kind of great about this horrible little film, you know? And everyone's just really unleashing their inner improv demon, I guess. <laughs> and there's some really colorful characters in here as well. Like some of the side characters are quite interesting. There's a guy that thinks he's an opera singer. Um, so yeah, I think there are definitely films like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where you feel much more compassion towards the people that are held there because they're more psychologically real. Um, and so that this film is just exploiting that kind of narrative for its shocking qualities. That's the point of an exploitation film, really. Um, but it, yeah, the cinematography is really great and it's just kind of one of those 60s oddities that you just think this is something different somebody was able to make a b film and because of that could explore things in a way that they wouldn't have been able to do with a bigger budget or under the studio system or with those kinds of constraints so it's pretty interesting it's also meant to have been a big influence on um, scorsese's film shutter island um, and i think it's just a good entry because it's different in the like long list of asylum based films everything that from horror to thrillers to art films i suppose so um that is the little delight b movie that is shop corridor so if you're looking for it it's from 1963 and it's directed by sam fuller um, yeah, so if you've seen this film and you have a different thing that you think is your favorite or you want to add anything, because obviously I don't go like majorly in depth here, but just um, let me know in the comments because I always like to hear from you guys. <laughs>